Hi, Dr. Lamb. Good evening, Ann. How are you? I am well. I hope you are, too. Yes. Good. I'm excited to be here, as always. Woo, I'm tired. Hot. <laughs> it is. We actually got a little break in the heat today. It's just mid-80s. Well, I just got back from Orlando last night, but I heard the temperatures here were scorching. I left here yesterday at 220, and I'm in the low mountains. It's only about 1,500 feet here. This is not the high mountains. It, mm -hmm. was, it was 97 when I got to Lake, when I got to Lake Norman. Um, it's 103. Wow. Yep, but now wow. I remember it that the lake's right there. I mean, it's a lot of humidity, a lot of heat coming off that right. water, as big as it right. is. Right. But yeah, it was. Uh, but it was drizzly rainy this morning, and it kept the heat down. We got here a few minutes ago. It was eighty-five on the thermometer. It says it's eighty-three now, so it's six o'clock. It's starting to cool a little bit. So it only hit about eighty-five today here. It probably hit a little more than that, like Norman. But yeah, it was. You know, that this is normal for this time of year in this part of the world, but it's been at least 10 degrees hotter than that for the last week or so. It's just, it's just burned everything up. It's been, it's been so. <laughs> hey, Erica. Hey, Erica. Hi. So, yeah, I can't wait for real summer to get here. This is just, this is just it, July and August will be miserable. Ooh, I'm not ready. I'm not, yeah, that's what I mean. I'm well, I'm I'm too old. I mean, uh, <laughs> heat, heat beats you down when you get old. It really does. Right. Um. So you know, I can't I can't stay out in it like I one time could work and do things. I have to you know got to be careful. You stroke out in this heat as hot as it is. All right. So we'll wait another minute before we get started. Let me share my screen and we'll look at a couple of things. All right, so let's see. Chapter presentation tonight for Erica and Brandon. Chapters five and six for Erica, seven and eight for Brandon. And then looking at our weekly schedule, obviously, next time we get together will be the weekend of the 13th and 14th. And at Wayne Community College and our presentations, our Sunday presentations is for weekend two. You're going to present to your fellow principals. There it is. So that's pretty easy. And then got to remember our two ethical scenarios that are due that weekend. And I'm going to cover Kate. I'm going to do Qualtrics on Saturday. In dissertation support, how to use Qualtrics, the survey, mm -hmm. uh, and how to analyze your, you know, it's important, yes, to be able to build and validate a survey. It's even more important to pull your data out of it and how to analyze your data. You know, that's why we require that you use Qualtrics is, is that we can see your data and we can pull it out. And we don't have to argue whether, uh, you know, what your data is. And so we're going to do Qualtrics on that Saturday. I think that'll be good. So bring... And we'll also give you some time and we'll talk more in depth about your about your evidence this semester. So we'll do that. All right, Erica. Uh, I, people who show up on time, we take advantage of that. People can watch the video here. Go ahead and get started. I'll stop my screen share and let you share yours and you can do your two chapters. <laughs> okay. Uh, let's see what we got here. Who have so much open? Give me one second. Okay, hold on. Okay. Um, okay. Here we go. And now present. Oh, move all this stuff out the way. All right, me. So I don't know what this is doing. Okay. So I had chapters five and six. So I'm beginning with my chapter five presentation. 
And chapter five is on individuals with disabilities. So this was a very rich chapter um, that I was actually glad that I had a chance to read all of it. Mm -hmm. So the, the why, um, in 1975, Congress recognized the need to help students with disabilities in the U.S. get the services they required for um, their individualized needs. And it was alarming to see that in the beginning of the chapter, they actually talked about how there were more than 8 million children in the U.S. with disabilities that had needs that had not been fully met. And so this does not even include the students who were not even identified at this point. So we had the 1975 PL 94-142 Education for All Handicapped Children Act, 1990 Individuals with Disabilities Act, IDEA, and in 2004 Individuals with Disabilities Education Improvement Act, IDEIA. So it has evolved over time and individuals with disabilities are protected by the federal, the following federal statutes. So these are some of the um, federal regulations that they came up with to protect students with disabilities. So just to break down some information about IDEA and IDEIA, IDEA guarantees students with disabilities ages three through 21, the right to a free um, and appropriate public education. So a lot of this stems from this. You hear a lot about this, FAPE, as well as the LRE, the least restrictive environment. Um, and under Section 504, it establishes a substantive and procedural due process of rights. And Dr. Lamb talked about due process the last time um, we were in class. So to meet eligibility requirements, states must develop a plan ensuring FAPE establish graduation rate goals and formulate a policy that ensures due process. So you have your federal regulations, your state regulations, and then each LEA must make sure they can prove that they are doing these things for students with disabilities. Exclusion from education programs and misclassification based on improper assessment hinders students with disabilities from receiving FAPE. And so something that we talked about was um, a functional exclusion so to me, that was a, a kind of newer term um, for me. But you know how we always talk a lot about making sure that students have the correct placement. So the case study that I'm going to talk about will deal with placement. SPED teachers must be certified and regular classroom teachers must be trained on the identification and referral process. This is where RTI and MTSS comes to play. So basically with RTI is where you're trying to provide those first set of interventions to see does this child actually need to be referred? And then you have your MTSS tiers as well. For example, um, this is a big one too. Language students who are second language students are learning English, they, fall, they must fall into one of the IDEA EIA categories to be referred. So a lot of times there are some misconceptions that they think a student must be um, referred to special education because there's a language barrier, but that does not constitute um, them getting an IEP. They have to make sure that they are behind because of their academics and not their language barrier. Yeah, um, flu so. Fluency is not a category. Right. Children with ADHD may be eligible for SPED services if they are found to have a specific learning disability, are seriously emotionally disturbed, or have an, or possess other health impairments. So these were just two specific um, types that they talked about within the chapter. Oh, go this way. So the IEP or Individualized Education Program requirement, of course, it is based off of the evaluation results. And the assessment itself is what determines what needs to go on that IEP and is designed specifically for that student. The IEP generally includes the child's current performance level, annual goals, short-term objectives, description of services and placement. Placement is a huge one. It will talk about that a lot in the chapter. Timeframes, transitional services, and criteria for monitoring the program. So, you know, as educators, you'll have your teachers come in and say, hey, I have your progress support for your students that needs to go home. So they're also progress monitoring the student to see how they're meeting their goals. 
Um, technology related assistance for individuals with disabilities act talks about assistive technology. So that's where you have your PDAs and different things that your students may need um, to make sure that they are receiving those specialized services. The IEP must be reviewed and revised annually with the appropriate team members. So if you just had an assessment, you need to make sure that the person who conducted the assessment is at the meeting to discuss the results. So making sure you have the right people in place. IDEA supports students with disabilities being placed in the least restrictive environment with students who are not disabled. And it talked about how it helps both ways. So not only is that child being immersed in a classroom with non-disabled students to help them learn to socialize, not be isolated. It also helped those non-disabled students learn about differences um, of others. So empathy and awareness. So each time we see this little light bulb, um, that indicates something that I learned or aha moment. So related services, this was very interesting to me because um, I was not as familiar with this as I should be. So it says related services viewed as one that must be provided to allow the child with disabilities to benefit from special education. So one of the related services they were talking about in this text was catheterization. And I was like, whoa, that's a related service and not a medical service. And it talked about it. I'm going to see if I can find the page 135. Um, so it says, hold on, because I had some extra. One moment. So basically in here it says um the US Supreme Court had a had a case that it ruled that clean intermittent catheterization, CIC, is a related service not subject to the medical service. So sometimes you have to understand what is medical and what is not because if it is a related service that can be done within the school if someone is trained to do that service then it has to be approved so dr lamb do you have anything you want to say about that because i was so gonna... I do. okay go ahead when i was high school principal at olympic high school we had the saint mark's unit there and that what you're talking about had to give shots and catheterize and do all that. Um, we eventually, after my first year, moved it to, to Metro school. Um, but there are things that come along that just doesn't make any sense in an educational environment, but that's what the law is. Mm -hmm. um, it, the problem is, is we were in Charlotte Mecklenburg, you know, we lit our cigars with hundred dollar bills. Uh, we spent $75 million dollars building a new school for those kids and I, mm -hmm. that's pejorative for severely and profoundly handicapped but if you're in a, if you're in a small place and you don't do that then you you your, your folks have to do that but the the issue is if if they have to have it, it the issue can't be well we don't offer that yes you do that's the lesson to be learned rather the venue it, we don't y yes you do you do you do provide those those associated services people think because they're associated that that means that um you just do them if you if you offer if you want to offer them or if you do no uh if they require them then you have to find a way to deliver them we look at it from the wrong end uh we think well if we offer this then we'll give it to them no if they need it we offer it that, that's right. the way it works. I'm not being very so clear. I was there. looking for the definition is on page 135, but I was looking for this mm -hmm. paragraph that I highlighted on page 137 towards the bottom. And it says, with increasing frequency, regular classroom teachers are called on to meet academic needs and perform related services right. such as catheterization, suctioning, colostomy, yep. and yep. seizure monitoring, which I had a student in my class that had seizures. Yep. Or sometimes when we get kindergartners who fall under you know as a child with disabilities and they're not potty mm -hmm. trained and we have to change diapers and things we're thinking like is this something i'm supposed yeah, to but, do but it know, is a related service ep the epi pen deal because kids now I, I don't know every kid now is allergic to everything and so everybody you know um some teachers use an epi pen more than an ink pen now yes. um 
with the younger kids who, who, who can't or won't regulate their behaviors. I mean, yeah, but that's part of it. That's what associated services are, but we make the mistake of think, thinking that those are not required. They're just associated that, that they're extras or they're incidentals. No, they're not. We have to understand that. Okay, so remember the light bulb means something went off in my brain. I was like, oh, this is interesting. So the next one for this chapter was the isolation and restraint laws. And you can find this on pages 140 to 142. So these laws were enacted um, for safety and protection of students with disabilities. Students receiving special education services should be restrained or isolated only if it is provided for the student's IEP or an emergency situations by statute or district policy. So we know we have certain students in our building who may be um, experiencing some behaviors that may be harmful to others or themselves, and you might have to restrain or isolate, but you have to be very specific um, when dealing with this. So it has to be reasonability for why we're doing it. And to talk specifically, if you have to isolate a child, you can't just isolate them and walk away. You have to monitor them. Um, that entire time and make sure that that was the right move, make sure that they're okay. Um, it talks a lot about supervision and make sure that in the cases where you have to do these extreme things, parents are notified um, per district's policy. And objectives of isolation and restraint laws, it talks a lot about why you may do that. But the um, part that was a little aha moment for me was the different type of restraints, such as a chemical restraint. It's like a medication you might give to the child to calm them down, noxious substances, isolation or seclusion, and mechanical and physical restraint. So of course, I'm familiar with physical restraints. Like in our AU classroom, we have this seat that sometimes this little boy has to sit in and it closes him in so he can't run or do different things but some of these were new to me like the chemical restraint or noxious substances I was not aware that those are really things that we do in the school system because we so, have such a wide range of those things we we now have to separately report um unlawful use of restraint or seclusion it's become such a big thing um and that has to be reported in power school along with disciplinary data now. It is now a part of that. Uh, it has become such a big thing. And we talked about this last class as well, so I'm not going to spend a lot of time on this. And we are familiar with children with disabilities and not being punished for conduct that is a man manifestation of their disability. Um, so Dr. Lamb hit on expulsion the last time. But mm -hmm. basically, if you are trying to expel a student that is a that is changing their placement mm -hmm. so you have to be very familiar with this because you can't just say oh they have to go no that results in going against that least restrictive environment and the stay put provision that i didn't even know was a thing until now yeah. um but, but basically a planning and placement team called a PPP can request a change in placement to a more restrictive environment due to disruptive behavior behavior an inappropriate placement. Yeah. And then suspension, of course, students who pose an immediate threat to school safety may be temporarily suspended for up to 10 days without an injury into whether the student's behavior was a manifestation of a disability, but school district documentation has to be present to prevent that burden of proof. Yeah, so you get 10 days, and we talked about that before, you get 10 days before you gotta do a manifestation termination now. Remember, change in placement constitutes roughly butt in seat. If the kid's butt's not in his regular seat, that's a change in placement. So we, if you if you suspended him out, of, if you did two days of ISS with him, you've only got eight days of out of school left. If you if you changed his room, if you rolled or bounced him in, in PBIS, those days count on that 10. If his butt wasn't in his regular seat for what, it doesn't matter why, that was a change in placement day. You've got up to 10 of those before you got to do manifestation termination of deck five, functional behavior assessment, updated IEP and an updated psychological and a behavior intervention plan, a BEP. You got to do all that at 10 days. Now, 
anything that his butt's not in his seat is a change counts toward toward one of his days of change of placement. Now, we talked about the caveat to that as well. And and that is showing a pattern. On the third time the kid does the same thing, that's a pattern. Don't care if you hadn't suspended him but two days. I've had principals complain, well, I, I still got I still got eight more days left. No, you don't. He's done the same thing three times in a row. We better do the map station. A pattern. If he's showing a pattern, uh, he may not. We, we got we got to go ahead and do it now. Well, I don't have to do all that paperwork. I don't want my hair to fall out. Not your choice, not mine. We're going to do that paperwork because we, we go to court and, and the kid's been doing the same thing over and over again. And we've been just been putting off the inevitable of doing the manifestation to determine if he's, you know, if he needs to change the placement or what he's doing is a function of his disability. And, and uh, why, why haven't you been helping this kid? But we still had, you know, don't be that idiot that goes to court and said, well, we still had seven days left. No, you didn't. He's showing a pattern. And if, and if, if during that pattern, somebody else's child gets hurt, that's not going to go well for you. It's not so going to go is, well. We're going to follow up on this uh, over our weekend and Saturday. We're going to do, I've got a really good PowerPoint. I'm not a PowerPoint person, but I've got a really good one that I've had made that I'll, I'll let y'all see. I'm not going to sit and read it to you, but we're going to have to do, we're going to have to do some hotspot work on, on EC uh, to make sure that, because that's where you get caught, you know, on, on this. And so we'll do a little hotspot. It won't take us long. We'll do a little hotspot work on EC, but I don't want to take all of all of Erica's time tonight, but yes, um, you, you got to know about how change in placement works. Um, but map station termination is not something you just out of hand avoid because you, you can not smart. So this slide just went over some additional information about, um, ADA amendments mm -hmm. and 504 as we're familiar with the 504 process as well. So I'm just going to go into my case study real quickly. Basically, this would be a common case study. So I think that's why I picked it. David Stearns is a first year principal of a middle school in an upper class community in the Eastern United States. The district has an outstanding reputation for its academic programs. Stearns admittedly is not as familiar with all issues involving disabled students um, as a more experienced administrator might be. The parents of a moderately mentally retarded student requested that their daughter be placed in the regular classroom on a full-time basis. Stearns was only willing to place her in regular education classes for non-academic subjects and into special education classes for academic courses. The parents are upset with the decision. So basically these questions want to know if Stearns justified in his decision, why or why not? And is the request by the parents a reasonable one? So I do feel like this, you know, would be common for a new principal. And to me, it was information that needed to be included. For example, what does the IEP All say? All right, let, let me interrupt you right there. Before we go any further, this one, this one's kind of a trick, Erica. I thought so, but this that's one's a I trick. This one's a trick. Brandon's already grinning. <laughs> Principal doesn't have the power or authority to do any of this. Who 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 places kids? Inclusion or mainstream? The IEP team. Yeah, that's what I said. What does the IEP say? Well, you know, that's exactly right. And that's what we follow, period. That that parents went tried to go around the process because they didn't get what they want in the IEP. They came to the principal. Principal has no legal standing in this. This case is over. The principal just says no. You got to go back to the IEP. I'm not a part of that. I can't. I can't. I can't overrule what they do. This is federal law. Federal comes before state. Th th this one. This. This one is a trick question. You, you know. You can't. You can't go down that rabbit hole of what the kid needs or don't need. The IEP says exactly what they get or don't get. Now, if they don't, they're not happy. They go to your EC chair and request an IEP meeting. And mm -hmm. those those meetings are collaborative with the EC folks and the specialists, the psychologists, all those people. Principal, she, they might as well ask the custodian. He'd have just as much authority to move a kid as, as the principal does. Brandon, you want to speak to that? Would you even think about doing such a crazy thing as that? No, I don't. Oh, wait a minute. 
<laughs> you already unmuted. Go ahead. I am okay. I when it comes to IEPs, I don't touch or make a I or make a decision if I have not if the team has not met. It's if you want a quick way to go to jail, yeah, um, get in, <laughs> do something to a, do something to an IEP or without without following proper protocol. I, yeah, I, that's I like I like orange, but I don't like I don't like to wear it every day. Yeah, it's not my color. I'm more of a red. But <laughs> the uh, even even if the principal is the LEA rep on the IAP team, and that's not smart either, by the way. Don't do that. Make your AP do it. Um, even if the principal is the LEA rep, because small school maybe they don't have an AP, um, you still the, the decision is collaborative. It's a vote, and and the and the, the 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 people who are paid to be that expert, you listen to them. Um, it, you you even if you are on the committee, you're just one vote. You're just one vote. You you don't move any EC kids. That that's placement decisions are not yours, and your district makes the decision on inclusion versus mainstreaming, not you. You know, mainstreaming being we send you to some classes with, with everybody, and then some we pull you out for your. And then inclusion means we send you to all regular classes and push the teacher in. Those those are mutually exclusive models. You either do one or the other, and you have to support whatever your district does. If they do a push in or a pull out, push in being inclusion, pull out being mainstreaming. That's the two types of exceptional children's programs that are federally recognized and legal. You can't just change from one to the other because the parent wanted. The, obviously, they're doing mainstream, and the parent wants inclusion. I, our district doesn't offer inclusion, and I don't. I don't overrule IEPs as a principal. That that's higher on the food chain than a principal is. The IEP is. It's federal. It's just All federal. Right. What what's the hierarchy? Federal law, state law, local board policy. Always got to remember that. You got to remember who's 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 boss. All right, well, that was chapter five. All righty. So moving on to chapter six, school personnel and school district liability. So this was a fun one as well. So everything in this chapter, you're going to hear a lot of negligence, foreseeability. Mm -hmm. You know, you just either you do it or you don't. <laughs> but if you don't, this is where these liability charges may come to play. So mm -hmm. the school is a safe place. You know, we are under in loco parenthesis when the children are in our care. And our duty is to instruct, supervise, and provide safety. And probably not even in that order because safety comes first. Um, reasonable supervision and standard of care for students before, during, and after school, including field trips. So I put some of this um, in different orders because it just yeah. meshed better. How many, so, how many, how many, how many students can you legally supervise with one faculty member in a large setting like lunchroom or after school or whatever? What's the ratio when you go to court? One to 45, write that down. One to 45. Okay. Now, I'm not telling you if you're in Garinger High School and, and there's um, 450 students in there and you've got 10 faculty, I'm not telling you that they'll stop a fight. You couldn't stop a fight if you had if you had machine guns at Ganger at lunchtime. What I'm telling you is when you go to court, you won't lose a negligence lawsuit on the basis of of inadequate supervision if you have one to forty five. Okay. You know, I hate to be that crass and that and that mercenary. Our job is you know, we can't. You're going to get sued. Our job is to win. You know, not not lose. And so understanding that that reasonable supervision and standard of care, there are actually numbers that go along with that. And if you don't meet those metrics, you're going to lose no matter what happened. And so the metric is one to 45, like cafeteria, auditorium, bus lot, you know, ball fields, those kinds of things, one to 45. That circles back to your duty roster to make sure that when you figure out everybody's duty every day, you have enough people in the right places. You know, the duty roster is during the day. Supervision schedule is after school. And they're all a function. They work off the master schedule of classes. And so you, you need to remember that. Now, 
in terms of negligence, there's 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 three functions of negligence: misfeasance, malfeasance, nonfeasance. Misfeasance is you did the wrong thing. You didn't mean to, but you did the wrong thing. Uh, malfeasance is you did the wrong thing, knowing it was the wrong thing. And then nonfeasance, you you had a duty to act and you didn't. That's the standards of negligence that you'll get you. They'll get you on on nonfeasance as well. You had a duty to act, supervise, and keep these kids safe, and you didn't. You say, well, I didn't do anything wrong. I, I wasn't the one that bit this kid, but but you weren't supervising the one that did. So you got to remember those three standards on negligence, misfeasance, malfeasance, nonfeasance. So the chapter did talk about before, during, and after school and field trips. Um, this was interesting to me because we had this conversation where before school, before teachers were even supposed to be on duty, certain daycares would just drop the kids off and just leave them outside by themselves. And we are in elementary school. So like, why do you feel like it's okay to leave these children out here unsupervised? But it did talk about, you know, reaching out to parents and, you know, letting them know these are, are the work hours. Please be mindful not to drop your children off, you know, early or pick them up late, make arrangements. Because, for example, if you're waiting for a student to get picked up after school, yes, you're supposed to make sure they're supervised. <laughs> No. But there are also specific guidelines within that based on the chapter. Right. It's it's uh, portal to portal that you're responsible for that child and you're responsible for the campus 24 hours a day. I had a car burn on one in Charlotte one time over Thanksgiving holiday, still had to report it, still responsible for it. But legally, that in loco parentis and places the parent, the Latin there uh, means portal to portal. From the time they leave to the time they get there and while they're there and back, at, at the bus stop to the bus stop. Now, it's very simple what you can do on the daycares that come and drop kids off for those. You simply have your resource officer meet them there and arrest the driver for child endangerment. I've done that, by the way. And they, they won't do that anymore. Um, they won't come leave kids there before you have teachers on duty. Um, because the earlier you, and see, the problem is the earlier you get kid, teachers there, they'll just start bringing them earlier and earlier. Mm -hmm. um, that that's the problem. And the next thing you know, it's four o'clock in the morning and they're bringing kids. Um, I mean, that's that, that obviously that's hyperbole, but I mean, you know, if, if they can't come before eight o'clock, then they, and then it's seven forty five. And then if you have somebody there at seven forty five, they'll start bringing them at seven thirty uh, and then they'll start bringing them at seven fifteen. I mean, at, at some point it, it's never ending. Well, you know, I had I had to have that when I was at Oak Hill. I had to have before school. They started. We brought we let them. We paid. We had young ladies from the child development over at Western Piedmont. We paid them to be there at six o'clock in the morning. And some of them are still waiting on us when we got there at six. You can't get there early enough for some of them. And if it's if it's a private place and you're having problems with that and you don't have a daycare on your campus to take care of them and they're bringing them before you simply have them arrested. They'll quit. Trust me. And I hate to be that way, but, you know, I, I'm not going to be responsible for a child killed on my campus because you left or adopted because you, you you were too lazy to wait or you, you wanted to get this off. You were charging parents for something and you expected me to provide it for and you were getting paid to be supervising these kids. And so, I mean, the, we're talking about life and death here. Uh, I'll, I'll do whatever I have to do to get you to behave yourself and do the right thing if a kid's life's in danger. And that's what we're talking about. So when an unavoidable injury occurs, there may be no liability unless it is based on negligence. And it just talks a lot about foreseeability. Were you mm -hmm. able to determine whether or not this could be harmful? So for example, it talked about, you know, defective equipment. Mm -hmm. If you know something is defective, what are you doing to make sure that it is not harmful to somebody? Did you put in the work order to have it fixed? Did you put up signs yeah. saying do not enter yeah. Yeah. or whatever it takes to make sure that you are ahead of the situation? Right. So well, foreseeability is a lot, is a big part of this yeah. chapter. And it's mostly facilities. All right. In that vein, one, North Carolina General Statute 115C 288G. I don't even have to, I don't have to look it up. Brandon, this is your prop quiz. Unmute yourself. How often do you have to do a fire drill in a public school? Once a month. 
How often do you have to do a safety check at your facil facilities for foreseeability stake? How often do you have to do that? Once a month. Twice a month. Twice a month. And must be written documentation. Mm -hmm. Twice a month, every two weeks. You got to do this because of what, of what Erica is talking about, foreseeability. You got a, a nail hanging off of a board, got a broken window, got, got something that, that's a safety issue or a fire issue or hazard. Twice a month, 115C288, you can look it up. Fire drill once a month, safety check twice a month, and written documentation of it. That's where foreseeability comes in. Let's go and back. So how, how did the people get in Uvalde, Texas, and shoot everybody up? Propped open back door. Safety check, should be checking that. Cooks get hot in the kitchen. They prop the door open, put a fan in it. Perpetrator walked right in. How did they get in the classroom and killed all 27 of those kids in the room? Doorknob was broke. So a lot of what you just talked about deals with the premises liability, making sure that the owners and possessors of buildings have a duty to maintain reasonable, safe conditions mm -hmm. um, and act reasonably to make sure that whether they're invited, a licensee, or trespasser, or even talks about, you know, parental mm -hmm. access. Anybody that steps foot on your building, there is a reasonable action that you need to make sure that they are safe on your premises. Individual liability, that's when if we do something that's negligent, it could be liability charges against us. Vicarious liability, um, in certain cases, because you are a district employee, the term, depending on the type of situation, the district could also be liable as well. Um, Dr. Lamb just talked about even students and bus stops, the school bus and bus mm -hmm. stops are extensions of the school and apply with the school, school code of conduct. So parents should be clearly communicated to about these types of instances, even at bus stops, because again, once foreseeability is attached, reasonable action should be taken. And then a big one for us these days is technology. Did you know that there was some cyberbullying going on? Mm -hmm. So if you knew about it, then you were negligent if you did not handle the situation appropriately. Mm -hmm. So a lot of this, a lot of this chapter talks about intentional and unintentional torts. You guys can go back and read these for yourselves. But I did list the different types. So of course, an intentional tort, exactly what it says. An unintentional could deal with something like the standard of care, um, like you, like he talked about the one to forty-five. Mm -hmm. Let's say if you were outside at recess and you had more than one class because the teacher had to go into the restroom and you were watching all of these kids, so you couldn't see something that happened. It might not have been because you were just intentionally trying to harm them. It's just that you didn't have the ability to control the whole situation at once. Mm -hmm. So just go back and look at some of these, like intentional, talked about assault, battery, defamation, uh, false imprisonment, mental distress, and then unintentional um, standard of care, breach of duty. And then they have defenses against defamation to include privilege, good faith, and truth. And then I do want to talk about a little bit of these defenses for negligence. So with contributory negligence, um, one second. So with contributory negligence is probably the most common defense employed in charges of negligence. Basically, when a teacher or administrator is charged with neg negligence, neither will be uh, assessed monetary awards when contributory negligence is proven. Um, and it says that basically an example of this would be how both parties contributed to the situation. For example, um, if the child, well, it talks about high school specifically because a lot of this age comes into play. So a high school student was injured while running in the dark after the lights off in the school building. That child contributed to it because they knew that was something they were not supposed to do. Um, assumption of risk is kind of what it says, commonly used as a defense in situations involving various types of contact related activities such as athletics. So if you sign this waiver saying, okay, I want to be on the football team and you go over 
what football consists of, you are assuming the risk if something happens, unless, um, let's say, the coach did not properly show you how to do certain uh, movements, then that person is negligent because they didn't properly train you. But you are assuming the risk by deciding, okay, this is something I want to do, and I know these things could happen. Comparative negligence is acts of those responsible are compared to the degree of negligence. For example, two students um, were chasing a fly ball during the softball game, caused a collision, they both received an injury. So again, comparing how did these two contribute to it? And then I'm not even gonna lie, immunity was a little foggy to me um, as I was reading it. Immunity. Hmm? We don't have it in schools. We did until 1992. We okay, don't. Well, maybe that was a little foggy. Yeah, we don't. You you've never known when we had it. We we lost it in 1992. It okay. was a case that emanated in Union County. We all had to be trained by Richard Schwartz and Associates as principals. I was in Morganton at the time. I had to go over to Hickory and get trained because we know we lost our qualified immunity um, as school administrators. We lost it. Uh, we no longer have it, so it doesn't. It does not apply. Again, now the standards of negligence apply: misfeasance, malfeasance, nonfeasance. Um, so, so there is no immunity for school people. Okay, good to know. So now, again, the light bulb went off when it talked about educational malpractice, because these are things that we honestly see a lot of, but. It never dawned on me like, oh my gosh, this is really, you know, something that school leaders should take more seriously. So educational malpractice generally is considered to be any unprofessional conduct or lack of sufficient skill in the performance or of professional duties. This injury is emotional, psychological, or educational, resulting from poor teaching, improper placement, or inappropriate testing procedures. So the light bulb went off when it talked about academic injury which simply means that a teacher is just not doing these students any justice by not giving the appropriate level of instruction or care while they are in their classroom. Or first case that I use in, in school law is they intentionally manipulate the grading scale to harm a child. That's the most common one in the world. Intentionally manipulating the grading scale, counting something way more than, than it should, uh, making something insignificant be the most important thing in order to manipulate and, and harm a child. That would be mal, that's mal fact, that's malfeasance. You intentionally did the wrong thing. Case study that I use is kid turned in his brother's homework assignment. She made it count more than half the yearly grade and failed him for the year. That has happened, folks. That's that's you know as crazy as that sounds, and so that's what we're talking about there. You intentionally do something to harm a child, and I'm not talking about physically. It, we, we, most of the harm that we get is done academically, especially mm -hmm. with the manipulation, the grading. One fifteen, one fifteen C two eighty eight A. Who grades and classifies kids? Teachers or principals? That would be principals. We can't let teachers do that because they will use it like a stick to beat kids. 115C, 288A. Principal grade and classifies pupils. They can't um, fail them. They can't, they can't manipulate state grading scale. Uh, one it's part of the presentation approved. talked about district implications. So I combined the two chapters together. Mm -hmm. So my first one was training for reg regular education teachers. And this is important. Like you were talking about inclusion and mainstreaming, well, we have these students in our classroom. Yes, we have an IEP, but do your teachers really understand what's in that IEP or how they would um, facilitate those related services like I was talking about earlier? Also, training for school leaders, because um, just like with that case study that we talked about, what are you allowed to do? What are you not allowed to do? Or do you really know what you could be liable for? Um, within the school system. And then creating a shared vision, um, that was more so for chapter five. Basically, we create these vision and mission statements, but do we really include um, certain aspects that we work through every single day? So we have students with disabilities in our school, 
how do we have a shared vision for how we're going to care for them while they're there? So those are my district implications. And then this case study talked about playground supervision, like we just talked about earlier. Three elementary school teachers are assigned to supervise the children who are playing on the playground. There are approximately 100 children engaged in a number of playground activities. Because these teachers do not have much opportunity to chat with each other during the school day, all of them decide to bring chairs to the playground and engage in conversation while observing the children. During this time, one child sustains a serious injury when he is struck by a rock thrown by another student. So what is the legal issue in this situation? Again, we talked about foreseeability. If you're sitting in these chairs talking to your friends, how can you give that standard of care where you're active, actually- It's called care? active supervision. Yes, actively supervising those students. And then, so what factors will determine the liability? Again, that's negligence because you're not actively supervising them. Yeah, even though you have one to 33 and a third there, and I've met some kids that I would count as a third, by the way, but although your, your ratio is, is one to 33, if you all sitting together, that's the same as one to 100 and you're not actively supervising, you not only would have to be actively supervising, you have to be spaced out accordingly mm -hmm. to the area mm -hmm. to supervise. If all three of you are in one place, that's the same as having one to 100. Yeah. That's what the court will view it. And so. I am done. Okay, so that would be negligence. Now, um, the question is, is would it be, I would say it would be non-feasance. You had a duty to act and wouldn't. I don't think that's malicious. I don't think that's going to go go criminal. It's just going to be civil. Uh, it wasn't like you hit the kid with the rock. Now, if you hit the kid with the rock, that would be that would be malicious. That that would be malfeasance. And you'd that not only would there be a civil, there would be a, a, a criminal case as well. In a case like this, you had a duty to act and you didn't. So that's going to be that's going to be a misfeasance. Or not a misfeasance at worst, mouth, you know, or nonfeasance. It's not going to be a malfeasance. But yes, you're going to have to pay. District's going to have to pay. Teachers could be sued individually. There's no qualified immunity since 1992. We have tort liability now, not qualified immunity. We're going to go over more of this on the Saturday when, when we're together. We're going to we're going to, we're going to hit EC a little bit. We're going to, we're going to work on it a little bit more. Um, because there's so, so many things, not a lot, but, but we'll, we'll kind of, we'll kind of go back through this. All right, Brandon, what have you got for us tonight? All right, I have chapter seven and eight. Give me just a minute. Let me figure this out. So any any positive touches, like it's all it's still all seeds. You know what I mean? Like yeah. like we didn't we were supposed to reap on that, but yes. we didn't reap. We we sold, which is fine. I'm trying to figure it. I'm, well, I'm trying to figure this out. Um, Can somebody help me real quick in sharing and sharing this? Did you hover over the bottom and click the share screen? Yeah, I clicked the share screen at the share and screen. Then click your whatever 
screen that pops up that has your presentation on it. Okay. Yes. It's not doing it. Uh, this is. Can you email it to me? Yeah, I can email it to you because I am, it's not All right. doing what I need to do. That's okay. Just, I got my email up. Brandon, or drop it in the chat and he can just pull it up like that. Yeah, you can, you can do that if it's, if it's got a link. Okay. Okay. I'll do it. You can you can link it in the chat if it's you know like it's a shared document that has a link and if okay. it's if it's a, just a regular doc X you just email it. Okay. Do 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 do. It's in the chat. Look at there. Y'all see that? Yes. Liability and student records, chapter seven. All right, here we go. All right, when we look at um with with chapter seven, it was um to me it was kind of a reminder of what things that I already know. Mm -hmm. And then it was um some things that's like, oh, I didn't know that this was a part of it and there had been some I could think of some situations where I actually could have um gotten myself into some some trouble in certain yeah. areas. Yeah. Um, so when we look at the liability of um students, the primary purpose of maintaining um educational records should be to aid school personnel in developing the best educational program for each student enrolled in one of the Supreme Court case, well, not that case, excuse me, state legislation would be the um, Federal Education Rights um, the Private and Privacy Act, which is FERPA, uh, which protects confidentiality of student records. And um, this act commonly referred to as um, the Buckley Amendment was enacted by Congress in 1974 to guarantee parents and students certain degree of confidentiality. And this particular um, FERPA has been amended multiple times since its um, instatement in 1974. And so in looking at um, FERPA in general, I, it came to my mind that certain some teachers and even administrators in some of our basic conversations, we don't realize how close we come to violating FERPA. Oh, yeah. There's two ways that we violate FERPA. Rarely do we do it by sending documents. One is we have ex parte conversations about kids out in public where we can be overheard. That's the, that's the, first, that's the first and most frequent way that we violate FERPA. Uh, I know a former principal who being sued right now, cases drug on forever, because two of his teachers were talking out in the hall, the third one overheard him and told the parent. So it's most, most FERPA violations are verbal. People talking about kids that shouldn't be, 
shouldn't be talking about any. Second one is grabbing any regular ed teacher off the hallway when we have an IEP meeting and the teacher that's supposed to be there that actually teaches the kid is not available. You can't just grab anybody. That if that if that teacher does not teach that kid, they're not supposed to be in that IEP meeting. That's a FERPA violation. Those are the two most common. Just ex parte conversations, talking about a kid out in public where you could be overheard, or it's you know it's it's after school. You're having an IEP meeting. Got the parents there. Got everybody. You got all your paperwork. Everybody's there, but the regular ed teacher took off. And so, you know, you grab another regular ed teacher. No, you have to postpone folks that that one happens every day in public schools in North Carolina every day. And that that's the biggest that's the biggest one uh, other than that. The, the the conversation piece. Those are the two things that get you. Rarely will somebody, you know, release confidential documents. Everybody knows not to do that. But those are the two things that get you on FERPA. OK. And so with the with the next session is talk it basically talks about um school districts, educational programs um can actually lose funding for violating FERPA. Um and then it goes into talking about um uh, parent and guardians having the right to inspect their child's records and that school officials should be um present to assist a parent or guardian in interpreting information contained in the files and uh, to respond to the questions that may be raised during the examination process. The interesting thing, I've never had a parent to even ask me to look at their child's CUME record to see what is actually in that particular record. Um, and so if a parent reviews a record and they see something questionable within their child's record, they um, they can request, they can challenge it. And in their challenging it, the schools have... Um, the school has 10 or less days to schedule a conference with the parent to discuss the um, concern. The text also said that the schools can have up to 46 days to make sure that um, they have met with the parent to discuss their the the challenge, the um challenge that the parent has presented. Yeah. yeah. And so and so again, FERPA protects the privacy interests of parents and students by restricting the unwarranted disclosure of personally identifiable information from educational records. Yeah. So every, again, everybody knows about the written stuff. You, I mean, it would be rare if you had a written case of a written one. It's, it's the verbal stuff and the letting people in IEP meetings but for convenience so you don't have to postpone. Mm -hmm. All right. So then the next three, the next three sections dealing with rights of custodial parents, rights of eligible students, and rights of school personnel and so what the um the rights of non-custodial parents that's one of the main thing that's one that um constantly comes up yeah because you have parents who are not together but they in the beginning of the school year everything may be fine that the the mom has no problem with the dad requesting to get the child's a copy of the child's report card and so forth but one weekend with a disagreement a parent can, the mom can fly yeah. in and say, I don't want the husband to, I don't want my child's dad to be able to access any of their educational records. And what most parents don't realize is as a school, in, unless they have court documentation that says that parent has no rights to the child um, educational records, we, as a school, we have to give that parent yes. um, that information. And so that's one that's one thing that some parents um, don't quite understand that we cannot we can't just not give a parent information because you upset with them. Yeah, you have to have documentation for that. And so um, rights of eligible students. So students may exercise the same rights afforded to parents or guardians if he or she has reached the age of 18 or is enrolled in post secondary institution. The student may inspect confidential records and challenge the accuracy of the information that is contained um, in the file and the schools have to respond the same way as they would with the parents and the, have to give the students the same, that same due process as they would a parent. Yeah. Now that's the one where you got to be careful right there with EC kids. If a kid, EC kid is 18 years old, he can come to the to IAP meeting by himself. 
Mm-hmm. If he's 18 years old or older. Now, here's the caveat. Here's here's the reverse of that. If he is 18, he can bring his parents, but you need him to sign a waiver. It's okay for his parents to attend. I, I would not let an 18-year-old in with parents um, without him having said it was okay because he could later claim, and this happens all the time, when his, him and his parents have a falling out, as Brandon just said, like, parents do when the kid and the parent have a fall now he sues you because you let his parents in you violated his privacy mm-hmm. yep that, that, that's the way that that swings the other way so if you've got and you know that we serve ec kids until they're 22 so this is not unusual for ec kid to be 18 or above we serve them until their 22nd birthday we have a lot of kids in the 18 to 22 range a lot yeah so you got to be real careful with them because, again, they turn on one another just like parents do. Yes. And so with the rights to school personnel, um, it's the same thing. And some people feel that I've had some teachers feel like that we put too much importance on the security of CUM records. Yeah. Like keep it basically keeping them locked down like Fort Knox. Um, so. In the, with, within this particular section, it says that um, teachers and, and counselors and administrators who have legitimate educational interest in viewing the records may do so, and a written form is to be maintained permanently in the file. So, it, like in all of our CUM records, every, teachers don't understand, every time you go open a CUM record, you are supposed to, to basically sign into that record your name, the date that you view that particular record. And so that's something that um, I think in some cases has fell to the wayside because it is it's not done that way all the time. Well, the, the, the standard that we're not attaining is the legitimate educational interest. It goes back to mm-hmm. the same thing I was talking about before with FERPA. If you don't teach that child, you can't go to his IEP meeting and you can't be in his CUMFO. You mm-hmm. have no standing in court. Legally, it's called standing. You don't have any. That's, there is no there is no legitimate educational interest if you don't teach that child. And if you teach him, then you've got to show what it is. But if you don't, there can't be any. Mm-hmm. You can't just go be snooping through and reading stuff. You know, the first standard of proof is, do you teach this child? Well, yes. All right, then what is your legitimate educational interest? If, if you don't teach the child, you can't have one. So you should never be in a child's cumulative folder that you don't currently teach. Mm-hmm. Well, I think I might teach him next year. Doesn't matter. I taught him last year. I want to see how he's doing. Doesn't matter. If you're not the teacher of record right now, let it go. And you've got to train your teachers to do that. Mm-hmm. And quite tangentially, this is when you get those ex parte conversations. I looked in so-and-so's record and saw this, this, and this, and this. That's when they start talking to one another. That's what gets overheard. That's how you end up in court. Keep them out of the records and they won't have anything to talk about. Mm -hmm. Keep them out of the IEP meetings. They won't have anything to talk about. Okay. All right, so students' complaints and FERPA, um, students' names are not covered by state and federal law granting confidentiality to educational records based on the complaints um, does not directly relate to students. Confidentiality issues involves involving school counselors. Um, within this, it just says a number of states um, have passed laws protecting the confidentiality of counselors. However, most states do not support the confidentiality protection for counselors, such as Michigan, Michigan, Nevada, have um, the most complete protection, but South Dakota, Ohio, Maine, Oregon, Alabama, and so forth, um, they provide protection to counselors in civil and criminal proceedings. School counselors are not required to share information obtained from students with their parents and records that remain in the sole possession of the counselors are not subject to FERPA. Um, and then we have the enforcement of federal, state and federal statutes. Federal and state officials may inspect files without parental consent in order to enforce federal or state laws or to audit and evaluate federal educational programs. So, so 
So then we have the Supreme Court case um, of, um, I'm going to mess this up, Aswaso, um, IS, Independent School District, and Falvo. And this is um, that a peer grading, peer grading does not violate FERPA. Student papers are not maintained within the meaning of FERPA when um, students correct them or call out grades maintained, suggested that FERPA records were kept in files or cabinets in a record room at school. Within this particular case, the parent got, basically the parent got upset because the teacher would have the students after they finished the class assignment, exchange papers and grade each other's papers and right. then exchange the papers back. And so the parent felt like that confidentiality was broken when in actuality it was not. Yeah, it's mostly EC files. And again, Kim records going in them, talk about those. What goes on in the classroom is, is not really confidential, is what they're saying to you. It's records. And again, everybody knows not to let you know the records out. But then you have teachers who go in and, and read them when they have no standing to read them and then talk about them. Uh, or they go to an IEP meeting because they're interested in it and they go out and you know they had no standing in that meeting. But yeah, it's it's not what goes on in the room. It's those it's those cum, cum files that we're that we're really interested in. Everybody knows not to let them out, but teachers get get access and then talk about them. That's your problem. Yeah. It, it was it was interesting in the current in the school that I'm currently at. When I first got there, the cum records were in a file cabinet, like in the, the open office. No, and it was not locked. And so when Locking I had to key. move. Yeah, lock so and I key. had to move to the council to the council's office and lock and key. Everybody got upset because they were no longer at easy access. I said they well, shouldn't yeah. be. Yeah, but they they just you know they just you know just nosy people. No, this ain't your business. You have no standing in this. You you have to establish that. If you do that, you won't have lawsuits because they won't know anything to talk about. And the people, the EC people, know not to talk about it. They're right. smaller than that. It's the reg ed teachers that kill you on purple. It's not, it's not your EC people handling records. That's what I'm telling you. It's not them that kill you on FERPA. It's your reg ed teachers who thumbing through files and talking out, you know, talking loud like me out in public. Mm -hmm. And so if we have no child left behind Act of 2002, annual notification requirements, the Secretary of Education is now required to annually inform each state education agency um, and each local education, each local location agency, um, LEA, of their obligations under both FERPA and the Protection of Pupil Rights Amendment. Um, so with this, we have the transfer of disciplinary records. FERPA currently permits schools to transfer um, any and all education records, including disciplinary records, on a student who is transferring to another school. And so we have defamation involving school personnel. When school personnel communicates a personal or sensitive information to another unauth unauthorized person that results in the injury to the student's reputation or standing in the school or that diminishes uh, the respect and esteem of to which the student, the student is held, they may face charges of libel slander depending on the manner and intent with which um, such information was communicated. And so with the information involving school personnel, in looking at this particular section, I found it interesting in how just when teachers get upset with a child and find out some harsh information about a child and how they go out and um, spread it or just spread falsified information, how it rolls back to this. And many of them do not quite understand um, how this could come back on them as defamation towards um, yeah. a student. FERPA, again, FERPA, you know, as I said, it's it's talking in the lounge, talking loud out in the hallway, digging into records, got no business in them, and then and then going out and spreading it around. And that that's that's how this ends up happening. Mm -hmm. And so the case study, um, we have the information and student records. A high school principal and a tenured teacher investigated a situation regarding suspected drug invo involvement of student of students in an inner city high school. They also provided counseling for students and their parents when they revealed their findings to the local 
law enforcement agency that drug involvement was present among specified groups of students. The parents sued alle alleging defamation. In this particular situation, uh, because it was a reportable offense. There they, you go. R.O. They, they discovered Yay. Drug, drug paraphernalia. They were not in violation, and this was not actually defamation, um, defamation, and it was not um, releasing illegally releasing student information because it was a reportable offense. Yeah, so. it is. It they required to report under one fifteen C two eighty eight again. Uh, certain certain acts have to be reported to law enforcement, and law enforcement comes first, and then the superintendent. Now, other acts have to be reported to the superintendent, and then to law enforcement. Mm -hmm. If it's criminal, law enforcement first. Got to do it. Drugs, drugs, criminal activity. RO, reportable offense. Got to RO, drug, drug paraphernalia. RO, drug possession. That means call the law. That's the first thing you have to do. So yeah, that was an easy one. All right, moving on. Um, next is chapter eight, and chapter eight deals with teacher freedoms. Very interesting chapter, um, and I had to pick, pull and pick what I wanted to put in the presentation because um, I would have definitely went over my slide limit within this particular section. But when we look at teacher freedoms, you have um, substantive and procedural considerations. With the procedural due process, it basically means that the state um, may not deprive any person of life's liberty without due process of law looking at teachers' First Amendment rights. Um, sustainative um, due process means that the state must have a valid objective when it intends to deprive a teacher of, of these particular rights given to them within the um, within their First Amendment rights. All so right. when we look at let's look at let's look at a, a a a more specific definition of these very broad terms quickly here. Substantive due, substantive due process, that you don't have to pronounce the T. Substantive due process is what are you supposed to do? What does the law say that you are supposed to do? The state, that's what that means. The, the, the authority, what do they say that you have to do in terms of the process of, of dismiss? What, what, what steps do you have to take to dismiss the teacher? Procedure is, did you carry them out? Substance, substantive, procedure, procedural. State says you got to do these nine things before you can dismiss a teacher. Notice, observations, all those things you got to do. And then the on the other end of that is, did you follow that procedure? Same thing for hiring a teacher. There's nine things involved in hiring a teacher. They're the same for everybody. The procedural is, that's the substance. The procedure is, who did those nine things? In rich districts, principal only has to do one. In poor district, principal has to do all nine. Doesn't matter. But the, the, it's the same nine everywhere that you have to do for due process. The question is, is who does them and who, how do you document to make sure that, that you can show that you did those things? Substance is what you're supposed to do. Procedure is what you did. Got to understand the difference in those. You don't get to decide what the substance is. The state or some authority does that, as in Brandon's example here. Your choice is, do you follow through and carry out those things that they said that you would do? That's where the liability comes in for you if you didn't carry them out. All right. Freedom of expression. So with freedom of expression, um, through the establishment of the First First Amendment, teachers are afforded freedom of speech. However, there are limits. So just basically like within the First Amendment itself, we have we have a limitation clause. We have that clause to where you do have freedom of speech, but those that freedom of speech is in parameters. And um, being a teacher, we are limited to that expression. Because if the expression that we has have disrupts the educational environment, then it gives the district grounds for suspension. It gives the district grounds for um, termination. 
So the level of protection provided to teachers is generally lower in cases where teachers speak on matters that are personal in nature as opposed to those that are interest to the community. So with freedom of expression, we have the Supreme Court case of Connick versus Myers. And the issue involved was a petition circulated within an office that was related to the proper functioning of the office. And this type of personal speech did not um, receive First Amendment pro protection. And um, then we have speech outside of the school environment. This particular case um, is a case that I found, I found very interesting because I can see it something like this happening again. And so it was Pinkerton, Pinker, Pinkering versus the Board of Education. And Marvin Pinkerton, he was a school teacher who wrote a letter to the editor of the um, Lockport Harrell complaining about the recently defeated school board proposal to increase um, school taxes. And so the letter complained about um, the board hand handling of past proposals and, all and allocations of funds favoring athletics over academics. And so the school felt that the letter was detrimental to the efficient operation and administration of the schools and opted to terminate Pinkering um, employment. And so Pinkering sued in the circuit court of Will County alleging his letter was um, speech protected under the First Amendment. And so the court ruled in favor of the school board and the Supreme Court of Illinois affirmed. However, um, USC ruled that Pinkering dismissal violated his First Amendment. The United States Supreme Court did the opposite of the, of the state courts, and they ruled that Pinkering's dismissal violated his First Amendment right of free speech because he was not operating um, within his school capacity. He was operating in his um, personal capacity. But with that, um, it did not disrupt the learning environment. And there was no evidence that Pinkering's statements were knowingly false or reckless. He was just stating the truth and basically voicing his opinion with, with his letter to All the All right, let me ask you this. What if he'd been a school, a school principal rather than a school teacher? Would that have made a difference? <laughs> um, Aren't principals at will employees? Yes, we are at will, yes. There you go. 1968, he had tenure. There's nothing, you know. Teachers now still have some career status protections that principals don't have. So if you were to do this as a principal, as an at will, absolutely they could let you go. Yes. As an at will. Got to understand your career status on that. So you, it's not, what we're saying is, is for the group of people that we're talking about here, for us, we don't have that protection that that, that teacher had. So you, you can't be going out and even if you're not, even if you're not lying, even, even if you're not, you know, trying to harm anybody, um, you're an at-will employee and you can absolutely be let go. Free, freedom, you know, freedom of speech is not free. And so the next we have academic um, academic freedom. So academic freedom as a concept that originated in the German universities during the 19th century um, with the express purpose of allowing professors to teach any subject they deemed educationally appropriate. So um, due to public school teachers teaching children of younger ages that are impressionable, their freedoms of expression in the classroom are limited by factors such as grade level, age, experience, and readiness of students to handle the content under um, discussion. So public school teachers are um, further restrained by the requirement that content introduced into the classroom discussion be related to and consistent with the teacher's certification and teaching assignment. With, with academic freedom, I feel like if teachers make sure that they stay within their standards and teach what the students ask them to not have these outside conversations, then they will stay safe of violating this. But we have the Supreme Court case here of Fowler versus the Board of Education of Lincoln County, where a, where a teacher did, showed a video within her classroom, but did not take the time to review the video prior to showing it. And so the video has some explicit language and some explicit scenes within it. And so in as a result of this, the teacher was terminated from her job. So of course she sued um, as a result of that, but the court recognized that Fowler was entitled to First Amendment protection under 
certain circumstances and that a motion picture is a form of expression that may be entitled to First Amendment protection. However, it ruled that Fowler's conduct in having the movie shown under the circumstances presented did not constitute expression of protected by the First Amendment. So the board's decision to terminate her was upheld. And she could have easily avoided this had she previewed the video first yeah. before showing it in the classroom. Yeah, that was pretty easy one there. Yeah. And so teachers' use of um, Facebook and social media. Um, teachers, again, you have that freedom of speech. They may express their outside views um, outside the classroom as, a, as other citizens with the awareness that their actions often affect the students they teach. So the courts in this case view um, is that teachers are role models for their students and must always be sensitive to and have a reasonable regard for the nature of the profession. So consequently, teachers, again, should exercise calls, caution when using Facebook, Twitter, Instagram, and other media. Um, so the example for this was a teacher was fired for posting a picture of herself holding a glass of wine and a mug of beer and using the um, B word on Facebook. The teacher was offered an option to resign or be suspended. Um, I, I share about you a lot of times it's important that you be mindful of what you post on Facebook, you, what you post on social media because of um, it can have career altering um, results. And so the next with freedom, freedom of association, um, the overview with this is freedom of association grants people the right to associate with other individuals of choice of their choice without threat of punishment. Although teachers enjoy these rights, they should exercise them in light of the nature and the importance of their positions. And so with the freedom of association has not always been recognized as a constitutional freedom by school districts. And so as countless restrictions were placed on teachers by their districts in the early mid 1900s, African Americans and white teachers were forbidden to socialize with other with 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 one another. And so in some districts, memberships in the National Association of Advancement of Color People the NAACP and Ku Klux Klan was fatal to the teacher if their if awareness of their affiliations became public. And so, and then we have um with freedom uh, continued with freedom of association. We have this uh, we have another Supreme Court case that emerged based on the complex laws that took place that were established in New York, calling for the discharge of employees and state education system who uttered treasonous or seditionous words. Perform the same acts, advocate or distribute materials supporting the overthrow of the government. And so basically with our associations in, uh, in organizations, we have to make sure um, that we know what these organizations are promoting and that they don't um, vi violate various things because of what they promote. So, um. Continue with the freedom of association. Teachers have the right to hold public office as long as, as long as their right in holding public office does not interfere with their jobs as teachers. Um, yeah, got it. I'm with you. Right to hold public office, dress and grooming. All right, that where we are? Yes. All right, here we go. And so with dressing grooming, we've had several cases that have um, appeared because of teachers feel like their freedom of expression was violated because of various rules within school districts, dress code policies. And so when you look at it, rules that restrict dress based on health, safety, materials and substantial disruptions, excuse me, or community um, values generally have been supported by courts and rules that extend beyond these cases are usually areas that have not been supported. And so we have this Supreme Court case of East Hartford um, Education Association and the Board of Education. And in this particular case, um, Richard Brimley was a public school teacher that was reprimanded for a failure to wear a necktie while teaching his English class. Long story short, um, the case concluded that Brimley, by claiming um, his refusal to wear a tie, is symbolic to speech and is protected by the First Amendment. The courts ruled in his favor. To me, this was stupid. Yeah. 
what does it matter if the if the teacher does not have a tie or not? Um, so uh, that to me that was just it was just yeah dumb. they should have lost that one yes, and so then we have the right um, to privacy, and so when we look at the right to right to privacy, these rights should be protected to the extent that they do not um, violate the integrity of the community or render the teacher or administrator ineffective in performing their professional duties. So the burden of proof resides with school boards to demonstrate that lifestyle choice oversee, um, excuse me, adversely affects the integrity of the district. With this and looking at some of the cases, it, um, did, for, for example, um, and I'm jumping to my case study now, but um, some 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 of some of the districts um, uh, some of the districts rules and 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 regulations were basically invading other people's private lives. It really they had no concern to be in. And then with religious discrimination in public schools, um, we look it deals with how um, this section requires that employers, including a school board make reasonable accommodations to employees' religion unless the employer can demonstrate the inability to do so based on undue hardship. So schools officials must respect that and uh, where possible and make allowances for teachers um, to be able to maintain their, their religious observances if such observances do not create a substantial disruption to the educational process. So if your particular religion requires you to take a three-day I guess I'll say break from school, but it moves from three days to now you have missed 10 days of school because of this, then there, there is an issue because of, you cause a um, substantial disruption to the educational process because with you not being in the classroom, students cannot learn. And so then we have the Family Medical Leave Act, which we all know FMLA, which is designed to allow eligible employees a total up to 12 work weeks of unpaid leave during any 12 month period. And then lastly, we have the case study, and this is teachers' freedom of speech and um, racial content. With this particular case, this particular this this case, this case study um, was set in the deep south. And this particular teacher was a white tenured teacher, and during a heated conversation with two administrators, she stated that she hated all black folks. And so when the word or statement leaked to leaked um, leaked and it caused negative reactions among colleagues, both black and white, the principal recommended dismissal based on concern regarding her ability to treat students fairly and her judgment and competency as a teacher. I feel that, that the principal was right in asking for her dismissal because if she made the statement that she hated all black folks, then to me, she would not be able. She would not be able to be an effective educator in the classroom serving African American students. All right. What do the rest of you think about that one, Doctor Lamb? This past school year, I had a Caucasian teacher use the N word mm -hmm. in the classroom. Mm -hmm. That's a little bit different case, though, isn't it? Well, yeah, but. On that notion, she resigned before anything right. to yeah. her. So. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That's a little bit different. That's a little. That's a little worse than this. Well, but they're both bad. But my point is, um, I hate to say this. I don't know how this one would go in court. No, I think the principal is absolutely justified. I mean, you know. You're asking these people, to, this person to work. But I don't know how, but but my point is this, where I'm headed with this. You can't worry about what's going to happen down the court, in court. You got to do the right thing. Mm -hmm. Sometimes, you know, that, see, I, I, I don't like it that central office administrators, and that's what you're all preparing to do, is is that they're, they're, doing, they're doing this calculation. Can we win this or not? No, the calculation is this right or wrong. Central office people tend to be Teflon people that nothing ever sticks to. And they're, they're always, and, and they, they don't, they don't want to take a stand. They don't want, they don't want to step out front because that then, you know, they, they can, bad things can stick to them. 
And in the end, I don't know if you, uh, again, I don't know if you could, could win this case or not in court, but I think it's the right thing to do to try. Um, and uh, so, yes, I agree with Brandon that you should do this. Now, the, case, the one that Ann brought up, well, that's a clear winner there. That's what I'm talking about. You know, she knew she'd lose in court, but this one, I don't know. I wish I did. I wish I, I wish I, I I'm ashamed that I, you know, that that I can't say that we win this one in court, but I think it's the right thing to do. And sometimes we just have to do the right thing to do. Um, we can't we can't lose that 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 notion or that ability. I want to make one point, and we're done. Cyberbullying. Everybody in the world tries everything in the world to keep from dealing with it. There, cyberbullying law is still on is still on the books. The only part of it that was repealed was the Twitter battle. If me and Erica get the Twitter battle and I start losing. I can't claim that I've been bullied, but everything else is still in place. If, and if it if it disrupts your educational environment. So it doesn't matter what device was used, where they were. You don't have to prove that they used a school device. You don't have to, you don't have to prove that it happened during school hours. Um, if, 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 it, if it happened, you have to deal with it. And you need to make sure the police are involved. They have warrant powers for, for electronic devices. And even if it's social media, that they can do chain of custody. So when the kid deletes it and, you, and you've screenshotted it and it says, oh, that's not, I didn't do that. Look at my account. I, uh, you've got a chain of custody on it. And so make sure police, first thing you do is get your police involved. A lot of districts are now designating a police officer and an IT person to help in cyberbullying cases because the last two kids shot and killed in Charlotte Mecklenburg were cyberbullying. The one at Butler, the one before that, the one at Albemarle was cyberbullying as well. Um, so many kids are killing themselves. The last, however, how many suicides? Four or five are all cases of cyberbullying. If if you're aware of it, you better handle it. That's that's the only that that's the the, the, the uh, that's my only advice that I can give you. If you know it, you better deal with it because the law is very clear. If it disrupts the educational environment or has the potential to, you have to deal with it. All the rest of that stuff. Where it happened, who, who, uh, what machine it was on, what, what phone, what computer, none of that, what tablet. That's not what the law says. Better understand that. And the only part that was repealed was the Twitter war deal. All right. Anything else for the good of the group tonight? We went a little long. That's okay. I enjoyed it. I'll follow up on some of that EC stuff. We need to talk that out a little bit. We, we need to hit a couple more notes on that EC. Need to talk. Um, not a lot maybe 10 minutes on DC, make sure we, we, we talk about that a little bit more. I've got a really good video I want I want you to see. I, I mean, PowerPoint, we, I don't read them, but I, I want you to see it. And it talks about child find and some things like that that are really getting hinky that you need to know and understand. That child find deal is going to be a big, big problem. With as many kids as we've got now going to charters and privates, that child find, that child find is, is going to be an 800-pound gorilla sitting on our couch. We need to talk about it and explore it a little bit more. All right. I'll see y'all the weekend of the 13th and 14th in Goldsboro. I can't wait. Thank y'all. Appreciate it. Thank you, Lamb. All right.